Well, hello there, everybody. <laughs> so nice to have you all here with us on this uh, beautiful Wednesday afternoon with myself and my esteemed guest this hour, Stephanie Page. Um, I'm going to come back around to Paige, Stephanie. <laughs> Thanks for uh, being on here. I'm going to come back around and do a, 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 a kind of an official intro and bio for Stephanie in a minute. But a um, couple of quick things as we get started here. Um, just want to remind everybody that we will be doing some Q&A. So whatever platform you're joining us from, whether that be Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube, um, feel free to type uh, comments into the chat there, comments or questions. And um, Stephanie and I will get uh, to what we can during the hour. And we'll try to save some time towards the end of the hour to get to a, a few more of those questions as well. Um, thanks for joining us here on TechBeat, where Leaders learn, innovate, and grow. My name is Earl Foote, founder, CEO of Nexus IT. Nexus IT is an outsourced white glove IT support and cybersecurity services firm based here in Northern Utah and servicing a nationwide footprint. Um, uh, when I do these Tech Beat episodes, these uh, video podcasts, a couple of times a month. Um, in the coming months before the end of the year, we've got Ashley Heather, the CEO of uh, Cleared4, uh, coming on. We've got Peter Bookman, the CEO of Guard Dog, uh, Josh Pitts, CEO of Shred Media, Media, and Rob Harder, Executive Director of the Christian Center of Park City, all joining me. So look out for those episodes and jump on here. Um, uh, let's see, I've got uh, Ashley coming on on October 21st, so a couple of weeks, and uh, it's about every two weeks, two and a half weeks or so. In between the episodes so uh, look for those um so let's go to the uh, the lady of the hour thank you so much for joining me today stephanie um for having me. let me introduce you all to stephanie so stephanie is a serial entrepreneur and startup enthusiast um, stephanie started her first company in her basement in 2011 in the direct selling industry um, about 10 years ago, that business quickly grew to almost a thousand independent distributors across the U.S. and sold um, over two and a half million in product in the first 18 months. After an exit in 2015, Stephanie transitioned her career to being an independent business consultant, guiding multiple startups from concept to launch and beyond. Today, Stephanie enjoys the challenging the challenge of helping startups tackle tasks such as operations research and development, uh, crafting effective marketing and sales campaigns, and so much more. So welcome again, Stephanie. Um, Thank you. I'm really looking forward to this hour with you and uh, you know, learning from you and, and your last decade of experience in um, you know, working on your own ventures as well as you know, helping multiple people with ventures. And right now I know you're, you're working on, um, on uh, as the CEO and, and partner of Clean Start, um, as well as you have some other irons in the in the pots. But let's let's go back, you know, twenty years, thirty years. Um, uh, you know, you're you're no older than thirty two, so you know we can't go too too far back. But <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so tell us a little bit about you as a person, as an individual, not a not a businesswoman, but or an entrepreneur, but. Uh, where did you come from? How did you end up where you're at now? Um, what are some of the things you, you like to do in life? So um, I grew up in the South, actually all over the South, majority of North, in North Carolina. I um, started my career in the medical field, actually, in nursing, and um, then moved to Utah. My uh, ex-husband was from here, and so I moved here to start a family, and I um, I moved here so probably 26 years ago. I've lived here a long time, and um, I have, I'm now a single mom. I've been single for about eight years. And so I've been working on my career for a while. Got the, I had the luxury of being a stay at home mom for 17 years, which was fantastic and was very involved in my community and in schools and sports and things like that. And I just loved, uh, you know, helping and being of service to people where I could be. I have five amazing kids. Uh, my oldest just got married. So I, I um, have a really great relationship with my family. We have a lot of fun together. And um, my two oldest are in business because of uh, the company that I started. So um, I, you know, I just have a passion for, for business. I have a passion for women in business. And I love helping people solve problems. I'm really good with big picture and organization and things like that. So 
it's 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 very exciting to me to start a new project and help them or help people see it through you know to being successful in whatever ventures they're in but just i'm very excited about the the challenge of starting something new did you tell me um one of your one of your kids is studying business um uh, you know uh I yeah, think you said so studying my, an mba uh, well my oldest uh, actually has his bachelor's in international business he um, in my first company, he ended up running my entire shipping department at age 18. He was still in high school and he was mm -hmm. in charge of shipping out 4,000 handmade individual products a month and just did a phenomenal job. And he just fell in love with the business. So he went to, to school to get his degree in business. He spent a uh, summer over in Japan um, learning about their culture and business. And so, yeah, he's, he's in business now. He works for Zions Bank. And then my daughter, just below, below him, she's 22. She's in school, in business school as well. So they caught the bug and uh, they love it. And, you know, I would love to eventually someday be in business with my children again and have them working with me at some level. But, um, yeah, they, they really enjoy it, too. That's super cool. Um, so five kids, single mom. Um, and uh, you got to be a heck of a mom if you want to be in business with your kids. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll be a heck of a mom if my kids want to be in business with me. <laughs> right? that's, that's true. If they, yeah, if they want to, then that says a lot about uh, their trust in me and, and the relationship yeah. that we have. And you know, I'll talk a little bit in this hour if, we, if I get to it about um, you know entrusting people with with their jobs and, and really believing that they can do it and letting them run with it. And that's kind of how I do parenting, and it's that's how I do. Uh, man and things like that so yeah i'm excited yeah. about it and from what i've seen you have like a really great relationship with your kids um i, I i'm somewhat envious because uh, as my kids have transitioned into adulthood and granted my mine are all boys and they're in that early phase of like honeymoon of transitioning from you know high school into their early years of college and they're they're a little bit distant. Like it, it takes a little bit of effort on my part to, to engage them, you know, but it seems like you have a really fantastic relationship with your kids and hang out with them a lot and have a lot of fun. Thank you. I do. Yeah. And honestly, I think it does have a lot to do with having girls. I have three daughters in the middle and boys on the ends and the girls really do engage the boys a lot more and they plan things and have cool ideas and the boys just kind of come along. So I do think it's that has a lot to do with it, but yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. We have a good time. We play and we respect each other and love each other, and, and everybody's so different. And we just um, we just value each other for the differences that we have, and we, we just really get along. It's been nice. It's a good phase of life. It wasn't always this good. <laughs> it wasn't always this easy. But I, I yeah. Think, so, yeah, I'm definitely noticing like that um, those young adult years of the kids. It, it's kind of a fun phase because. As teenagers, they're usually a nightmare, you know, <laughs> they're, 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 they're constantly, you know, rebellious and uh, testing the waters and, you know, um, and constantly trying your patience. Um, fantastic people. But but you know, when they're finally adults and they're kind of coming into their own, it's, it's a it's a fun place to be. And like you have a little more just kind of adult, you know, relationship with them, which is kind of fun. Wow. Yeah, I like it. So tell us um, a little bit about you um, outside the office. What what kind of stuff are you into? What are your hobbies and what do you like to do? That's a good question. A lot of times mothers uh, don't have, get to have hobbies, but <laughs> um, I, I enjoy hiking and, and yoga and I read a lot, mostly business books or personal development books. Every once in a while, somebody will uh, throw me a a novel or something and I'll read it but you know really just spend a lot of time on, on personal development and developing my children as human beings and so that's pretty much it just hanging out with my kids and, and spending time and um, being out in nature when it's warm I'm not a fan of the cold weather but in the summer I love being outside um, yeah I just I, I'm fascinated with human psychology and so I love to learn about people and um, learn about why people do what they do and um, have a phenomenal group of friends that I spend a lot of time with and we just nurture each other and love each other. And uh, yeah, I think my hobbies are people, my, the people in my life are, are what I enjoy spending my time with. Yeah. That's super cool. I, I always enjoy really understanding, you know, the backstories and, and um, understanding who, uh, founders and entrepreneurs and leaders are outside of 
you know, the, the public persona uh, that we see or the, that is put on, right? And um, it's, it's always refreshing and interesting to see that we're all just human, you know, we're, we, we all have the things that we're working on, you know, with uh, at home or with family or hobbies that, you know, that we're engaged with. And um, just, it's cool to see that, that kind of authentic side of people that sometimes is a little, a little hidden. And so um, I wanted to give well, I will say this, I'm an adrenaline junkie. So that's something that people don't know a lot about, about me a lot is that I've done everything from skydiving to bungee jumping to diving with sharks, bobsledding, zip lining. I mean, whatever it is, if it's fast and crazy, I'm usually about it. So, I mean, you know, say if somebody else has done it before me, right? I'm not going to jump the first one to jump off a cliff, but, uh, but yeah, I do. I love uh, adrenaline. I love driving fast and uh, I don't know. I just, for some reason, I really love um, taking safe risks and uh, just the feeling that gets and it's kind of like being an entrepreneur right we we take these risks and it's so it's so exciting when it turns out really well or when it when it works and so yeah I'm, I, I love adrenaline sports okay I, so I, I did not know that um, first of all um, okay. second of all I think that uh, you're, you're somewhat inaccurate because as a founder you have to be willing to be the first one to take the jump off the cliff sometimes uh, in fact, m most of the time, you know, most of the time you're the first one to take the jump off the cliff. But maybe that's, you know, uh, that's more metaphorical than it is <laughs> literal. <laughs> However, yeah, little... yeah. 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 if I recall, I could be wrong, but if I recall, you and I went to the grid with a group and <laughs> you were hyper competitive. You were, you yeah, were true. like knocking you know, like really good, yeah. you know, drivers off of the track and you were consistently like the, that top one or two in, in that whole group. Yeah, that is true. I will say I did uh, take first in the women's heat and uh, I, I was beat by 0.06 seconds, like three times by Dave Williams, who just, just, this is yeah. just a little bit faster. But yeah, I, I am super competitive when it comes to uh, driving fast. I guess so. <laughs> I, I had not seen that side of you before and it, it was fun because I, you know, always known like this kind of very sweet and, you know, kind of calm down to earth, Stephanie. And then you were like, hey, get out of my way. <laughs> uh, and I, I, know, I, I don't speed on the, well, actually I do a little bit, but you know, I, I drive <laughs> safely when I'm in my car and, but when it comes to like jet skis or go karts or things like that, I do, I really love to drive fast. Yeah, I love the fact that you remember. I love the fact that you remember it was 0 0.06 seconds that you lost by. <laughs> I know. I told him I want another chance at the title, so I have to, I have to do it again sometime. Yeah, Dave's like he was super hyper competitive in that situation too. But I was I was trying to run him down, but I was like, I, I can't catch up with this guy. I was you know consistently kind of that third, fourth, you know fifth kind of position getting beat out by you and Dave, but I just, I couldn't catch up. <laughs> well, I, it physically. I had bruises all over from the, you know, the, the wreckage, but it was fun. It was worth it. Yeah, totally worth it. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's transition a little bit into, uh, you know, business and let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, about some of the things that you've experienced and learned over the last decade. Um, you know, again, you've, worked on your own ventures, you've been part of, you know, um, helping other ventures, you know, find their footing and, and get some traction and really scale, right? And so um, uh, I know you've kind of figured out some formulas why you think that most startups, uh, you know, end up failing or really, um, you know, stumbling in their early days and early years, maybe. So tell, tell us a little bit about that from your experience. What have you learned? And um, what sort of advice do you have there? Sure. Well, you know, um, there's kind of three main reasons why historically, statistically, you know, you can look this information up, why startups fail. Um, around 90% of startups fail and 10% of those are within the first year. Another 70% are within the next, you know, two to five years. And so um, one of the, the main reason that startups fail is misreading the market demand. Um, you know, people have this idea, right? They think in their mind it's a great idea, and, you know, 
people tend to surround themselves with yes men, you know, oh yeah, that's a great idea. You know, people will tell you all day long, your idea is great because they don't want to hurt your feelings. And so a lot of times people will, will start a company based on an idea that they have because they think it's great. And ultimately we really have to do the research and find out if the market can support that idea. Is it, uh, is it an idea whose time hasn't come yet? Is it something that the, the demand will support in the market? Um, you know, people try to, to, you know, build a product and look for customers for their product. But what you really should be doing is find, um, is, you know, find products for your customers, find out what the need is in the market and then fill that as opposed to saying, this is what I have. Let's see if we can find people that want that. So, um, you know, we, you got, got to research and um, what are the, what are the assumptions you're, that you're making that are driving your revenue projections and where did you get that information from? So that's the main, main reason that startups fail is they just, the market, they just don't have the, enough information to know that the market will support their idea. So the second reason uh, that, that startups fail is, is undercapitalization. You know, people want to bootstrap their, their businesses. And sometimes that works. I mean, bootstrappings work for a lot of companies. A lot of companies started in their basement, just like mine. And we bootstrapped it and we grew. Yeah, yours, right? I mean, it's not that it can't be done. It can be. And a lot of people do it well. Um, the problem is that if you don't have enough capital to overcome, you know, some of the hurdles that inevitably come up when you're starting a business, you're stuck. You've exhausted all of your friends and family and banks and all your resources are tapped out. You just can't go any further. And so, you know, really being uh, well capitalized is so important, um, you know, in, in making sure that you can get through that first five years. You know, having a, a really solid business plan is critical in, in knowing when, you know, what's coming next. And um, you, know, you can't obviously um, predict everything that's going to happen. But if you have the money, at least, you know, you can survive it. And if you're bootstrapping, a lot of times your head is in the wrong place. If you're as a founder, if you're constantly worried about money and thinking about money and how am I going to how am I going to pay the bills and how am I going to pay my employees, you're not focused on building your business and your head is in the wrong space. So being undercapitalized is, is definitely it's a really important point. A kiss of death. Yeah, yeah, that's it's really it's really difficult. Um, the third thing that um, that the third the third main reasons why startups startups fail is um, is having the wrong people on the team. Um, not ha you're having a weak founders team, and that doesn't mean just the founders as as owners, but the team that you that you create. Um, and the book Good to Great, Jim Collins talks about you know getting the right people on the bus then figuring out what seats they need to be in on the bus and then figuring out where the bus is driving. And that's so important because, you know, like I said before, you, you can surround yourself with a bunch of people that are going to say, yes, oh yeah, yes, yes, that's great. But you really need to surround yourself with people who will push back, who will say, hey, listen, what about this? You know, you, you got to put your ego aside and, and, and just say, hey, listen, I don't know everything. This might be my idea and this might be my baby, but you got to be able to hear sometimes your baby's ugly you know it, it hurts as a founder and as, a, as an entrepreneur to have somebody say hey you know what this might not be the best idea but ultimately that's what you need to surround yourself with is people who have been been where you are who've done what you've done and really won't aren't afraid to say to you hey listen you might want to take a look at this from a different perspective um, or, or you know be able to hear something that that you might not want to hear, but, but ultimately, yeah, you, you've got to, you've got to build a team of people that support your vision and support you and know what you don't know. Yeah. Really, some really, really great points there. Um, you know, uh, we actually got a really good question that comes in it came in, but I'm going to come back around um, and just a couple of comments on that. Um, I agree hundred percent on, on the product market fit sort of scenario. Um, you know, uh, that, that's one of the, the most common mistakes that I see, you know, startups um, uh, commit and, and, you know, new founders commit, they, they assume because them and their three closest friends, you know, think that this is a fantastic idea. They assume that suddenly there's going to be tens of thousands or millions of people or businesses that think it's a fantastic idea as well. Um, and they really haven't done any sort of market research. Um, I'm, I'm right now reading the book or listening to the book, uh, Masters of Scale, um, which I'm, I'm really enjoying. And um, it's interesting, they, they talk a, a little bit about, and I'm, I'm 
drawing a blank on the artist's name. I could look it up, but I won't worry about it right now. Um, anyways, the artist talk, not the artist, the author, I should say, um, the author talks about um, how it, it is really important in those early phases to surround yourself with people um, that are not the yes men, right? Um, that are not like really close connections that are just going to be like, yeah, that's a fantastic idea, right? Um, conversely, you also need to um, understand and have thick enough skin to know when you're just listening to somebody who's just a negative Nelly, right? Um, and you, you got to find the balance and the medium, you know, and, and really hone in and tune in. And actually, if at all possible, if you're building like an MVP, um, you know, a software product or some sort of product people are going to interact with, like actually witness how those people use that product or or gather the right data so you know that, that uh, you understand how they're they're using the product and what problems it's maybe solving for them or how it's helping them. Um, you know, the book talks about how so many ventures start off um, thinking that they are resolving some specific problem, but then they're finding that um, users, early adopters, are really um, kind of hacking, you know, their, their system and using it for a different means than what the founders envisioned, right? And so, and you can't figure that out unless you're like attentive to, you know, how users of your product, or you know, uh, maybe it's not users, maybe it's a business, like, you know, I'm business to business services, right? Um, and so uh, if you can really understand how they're engaging, uh, you can figure out a, a lot of, you know, a, a lot of those sort of scenarios. Um, Undercapitalization is certainly very important. I, my business has been bootstrapped since day one. Um, I've never capitalized. Um, and look, I, I'll, I'll be the first to tell you there are pros and there are cons, um, 100%. And, and sometimes you're going to hit the wall. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you own it all. You have the final say. You know, um, you know, you, you, um, you don't uh, necessarily have to dilute your cap table or, you know, or culture and things like that, which have always been important decisions for me. But um, it, there's been plenty of times in early years when, uh, you know, we hit a wall and I, I had to make the sacrifices of, okay, well, I'm going to go without pay for three months to figure this out and get beyond it, right? Um, and that's not a luxury all of us want to have or can have. Um, and sometimes if you have a safety net, now capitalizing without a really viable idea and without any revenue can also be very challenging itself. And so um, that's something you have to be realistic with, you know, with. Um, um, and then the other um, important thing or the other uh, interesting thing that came up for me as you were mentioning um, all of that is actually in Masters of Scale. And it's not just in Masters of Scale. I think you mentioned good to great. And I believe that the concept is... Um, uh, fairly well portrayed and good to great as well. And that is that a lot of um, founders feel like uh, I'm just going to get something out there and I'm going to start getting into revenue and I'll worry about all the other stuff later, particularly culture, right? Um, and the problem with that is, yeah. So m my opinion, and I think, you know, a lot of these authors opinion is, You've got to make culture a significant priority up front because you need to make sure you're getting those first, you know, 50 hires are paramount for you setting the tone of how the organization is going to operate and govern itself. And generally, that's a lot of kind of unwritten rules that, you know, lie beneath the surface that is part of the culture. And if you're if you don't have the right people. And it doesn't mean that they're all robots, that you're all the exact same people. In fact, that's not a productive culture. You need diversity. You need difference of opinion. But you also need people who are committed to a vision together and who are working towards that vision. And, and there's an underlying or written kind of you know statement of culture and values and how we how we behave and operate within this organization. And so um, certainly and trying to add on culture, like let's say you've scaled massively and suddenly you're at 2,500 employees and you're like, oh, this culture is trash. We need to fix this thing, right? At that point, it can, yeah, it can literally right. take you like five years to turn it around, right? And it has to be micro shifts 
little shifts along the way. And I've had to do some of that. You know, I won't lie in you know, my 23 years. You know, we've gone through portions, you know, portions of our history where I felt like the culture was not where we wanted it to be. And we've had to do these kind of micro shifts along the way. Um, but you're far better to kind of try to nail that as much as possible early on. Sorry, I know you had some some you know some other comments there. Oh no, I mean well, that's a great point. You know, you can as a founder, it is your job to set the tone and the culture of the company because you can hire one person that comes in and changes the entire thing, and then and then what do you do? You can't get rid of that person, but you you know you also it's really difficult to change a culture that's already been ingrained in a company you know it, having a solid business plan is really important and a lot of entrepreneurs focus on that so much that they forget that there's a thing about culture that you really have to do too it's the, you know the, the business plan covers all the tangibles but investing in the intangible sometimes creates the biggest roi not just for your team and your culture but for yourself personally you know personal investment in and in reading books and podcasts and ted talks and all those things that that help you think outside of the box and the one little idea that you have, like you've got to expand and broaden your mind and, and your soul and your, you know, whatever you believe in, but you know, you, it's not just about this, you know, it's, it's your heart, it's your soul, it's your, your spirit, it's your vibe. It's, it's all those things, right? Like it's so important to, um, to really, to one of my favorite quotes is um, always do everything with integrity, but realize that not everybody does. And, and I think integrity is such a huge part of the company culture and, and the core of your value system. You know, having a vision statement that's written and printed and visible that everybody can come on board with. And you're right. You don't want everybody that's the same, but you want everybody to uh, to be involved in your vision. Because if they're not if they're not supporting your vision, they're going to go off in a different direction and that's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. So important, really. Um, so I don't want to butcher this name. I think it is uh, Kardik Rahman um, asks, is finding beta users sufficient to validate market demand pre-sales? At what point do you say, yes, I have validated my market? You know, that's a great question. And uh, I do a lot of reading. And another book um, that I read is called Lean Startup. And um, in that book, you, you mentioned the MVP, your minimum viable product, right? He says in the book, if you are not embarrassed of your first version, you started too late, <laughs> right? <laughs> so yeah. yes, I mean, in beta, beta testing is very important, right? If you can afford it, if you have enough money in the beginning to just kind of get a, a first version of your product or service available to a market of beta testers, and get that feedback it's critical you, you, you avoid I and mean, if you if you invest a million dollars in your first iteration and then it doesn't work you're in big trouble so being able to do that um you know to, to come out with a version get the feedback iterate and do it again like you repeat that process and that's absolutely um a great way to do it and i it's hard to say yes i've validated i mean I, it's hard to know when you can say yes, I've validated my market. Depending, I guess it depends on what the business is and um, you know how big your test market was and what the product is. And so uh, I think you kind of know. You just know, you know, if you if you're getting a ton of really positive feedback and your users are saying yes, this is exactly what we wanted. They're, they're, it's working like it's supposed to be working, and it's it's doing and creating the value that you designed it to create. Then yeah, I think you, you you're safe to say we're ready to go. And just know that even when you push the start button and you say, let's go, you're still going to have to iterate. You're going to have to change. I mean, your product has to be able to flow with the market and um, it, it, you have to be able to keep up with technology and keep up with the changes in the world. I mean, who would have ever thought Blockbuster would be out of business, right? I mean, so even Redbox, I mean, the that young, was like- The younger guests on here are like, what's Blockbuster? What's <laughs> <laughs> Redbox, okay. Redbox was the yeah. coolest- and I mean, you know, the digital streaming services have just killed all that. So you've got to be able to to shift and, and change and go with the market and with technology and with what your users want. And uh, and you can't say this was my one idea and I'm never changing it or you'll you'll die on the vine. Yeah, I think it's really important to recognize you, you need to you need to build in to whatever evaluation you're doing if it's uh, you know beta. Um, MVP or, you know, you're actually rolling out, you know, a product to the masses per se, you've got to figure out how to build, build in really robust feedback loops. Um, and, and you've got to be willing to really listen to uh, what, what that market says to you, right? Um, yeah, you want to understand, 
what you're doing well and positive and you want, you know, you want to stroke your ego with all that. Oh yeah, we, we've done a great job and everything, but you also want people to say, Hey, this isn't working for me. Like, for example, last night, um, yeah, I went to go do a post about, uh, you know, our, our segment here today, Stephanie on LinkedIn. And, um, I was, I was trying to figure out, um, where the link was for the LinkedIn event that had been created for this, right? And I was on my mobile phone and on the desktop version, you can, you, you can just click the menu button and there's a there, you know, copy link, right? Well, that wasn't on the mobile phone. Um, and so I, I picked up my iPad and that was an Android, by the way, I picked up my iPad, pull up that mobile version and the entire interface was com is completely different of LinkedIn on the on the iOS versus Android, and that link's still not there. So I decide I'm going to open it in a mobile browser and see if I can you know find it in the mobile browser. Still completely different interface. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about four different interfaces now. You know, desktop, iOS, Android, and the mobile you know browser version, and every one of them were different. All of the navigation buttons and everything were different. LinkedIn has not, right? They have not listened to their target audience. I'm like, make the platform the exact same on every single you know device, and then it's easy for me to use. I don't have to go hunting for all the buttons and try to figure out. Finally, I had to switch my, you know, uh, on my iPad, I switched um, the browser to desktop mode, and then I was able to go, you know, find the link and put it in the post, which was, you know, took me like wow. ten minutes when it should have taken me fifteen seconds, you know. Um, yeah. So it was, it was super, it was super frustrating. But that's one of those things. Like you need to listen, and uh, you know, the other thing that's really important here is oftentimes is when you're engineering your product, um, you the way that you use the product seems intuitive to you, and it seems to make sense to you. But more often than not, it does not make sense to your 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 um, your target market, and you've got to figure that out. So you need to watch them. You need to see how they're actually using you know the product and what they're using it for. Um, so Josh, Josh, uh, and Josh, I I know I pronounced your last name wrong. Uh, Josh uh, Jamius, I believe it is, or Jamius. Um, I apologize, but um, I'll get that right one of these days. <laughs> um, he asks, and uh, no, another really good question, how do you identify the, the gaps in skill set on your team? Um, how do you know if it's worth your time as a founder to learn a new skill set versus hiring outsourcing for that skill? What are your thoughts there? That's a great question. You know, a lot of times as entrepreneurs, we wear all the hats, right? We do everything that needs to be done. We've thought about this business or idea probably thousands of hours by the time we actually get to uh, launching our companies. And um, in the beginning, it has to be that way, right? We don't have the resources um, to be able to outsource everything. And so knowing a little bit about everything is a good idea because you want to know everything there is to know about your company and, and how it works um, and, the, and the best things for it. But when, when you start adding people to your team, the best way to know where the holes are is ask your team, right? Ask them, okay, what, what isn't getting done? Um, what do you need help with? What is it? Where, what are we missing? And, and I'm going to talk about mentors here in a little bit, too, if we get the chance. But, you know, having a mentor that you really trust who has been where you want to be or is where you want to be and has done what you're doing um, is really critical because they can oftentimes see things from, you know, the 10,000 foot view that you can't see because you're in the thick of it. You're right in the middle of it and you're head down. You're focused on all the minutia and they can sometimes say, hey, listen, you know what? You need to hire a bookkeeper or you need to hire a receptionist or you need to hire an assistant or whatever that that hole is. Right. It's whatever's tripping you up and making you spend the majority of your time that's not producing value. Like if you're if you as an entrepreneur, if you as a founder aren't producing uh, revenue from your time, then you need to be hiring somebody to do that for you. Because if you can pay somebody 10 or 15 or 20 or even $25 an hour to do that particular job, I mean, as an entrepreneur, we, we have to know in our minds, my time is worth $500 an hour, right? My skill set, my brain, my ideas, my, my focus, my vision, that's worth or whatever number you want to put on it, right? So if you can hire somebody for $25 an hour to do that, and your time is spent you know, bringing in $500 an hour revenue, then that's what you need to be doing. So yeah, just asking your team, 
what what's not getting done where do you need help where are you struggling and then just uh, just having a mentor say hey somebody look at this with me and tell me what i'm missing where are my holes what am i not doing you know how can i run this more efficiently those things are really critical and and yeah. getting up I agree 100% uh, with all that. And look, as, as a as a budding founder, you're going to have to wear all the hats, you know, pretty much. Um, you're going to have to understand at least the basics of the finance in your organization, the operations, HR, um, you know, marketing, sales, uh, the whole gamut, right? But you, you generally fairly quickly are going to uh, identify if you don't already know where your strengths are there, right? Um, and you need to start backfilling all of those those potential weaknesses as your budget permits. You need to backfill those positions, you know, and hire for the people who can really cover you know cover your back on on all those things that maybe are not your forte. Or again, as you said, um, as a founder, you need to focus on those core few things that are really moving the needle for the organization. And if you're if you're caught in the minutia of, you know, I'm spending 40 hours a month in doing invoicing and bookkeeping. Um, that's something you need to get rid of pretty quick, right? Um, be, because you, you need to focus your time on what's, you know, really moving that, that venture forward. Um, and um, anyways, yeah, I mean, I had a few other thoughts, but we should probably, uh, you know, move on to kind of the next um, topic here. Did you have something else you wanted to mention, Stefan? Well, I was just going to say, you know, this is where, where kind of the ego comes into play, right? A lot of times as entrepreneurs, we think we have to know everything and we think we have to be the expert on our business and everything about our business. But in reality, that's not true. And a lot of times if you're looking for investment capital, even, um, you know, investors want to know that your ego is out of the way. They want to, they don't want you to say, yes, I know all the answers to all the questions. They want you to say, hey, you know what? I don't know the answer to that question, but I know where to get the answer. And I'm going to surround myself with people who know the answers. And, and you know, Elon Musk says all the time, I'm, I'm not a rocket scientist. I don't need to be a rocket scientist. I hire a rocket scientists to do their job. And I surround myself with the people who are smarter than me. And if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong, wrong room. So surround yourself with the people that, that have those answers. And don't feel like you have to know them all. Or don't feel like you have to do everything or, or be the expert at everything just because it's your business. You just have to be smart enough to say, hey, I don't know the answer to that, but I know who does. Yeah. Well, and really, that's one of the best qualities you can possibly have as a founder as being, you know, is being being comfortable with not being the smartest person in the room, uh, being humble enough to say, uh, you know, it's OK that there are people here that know more about some of these topics than I do. And I can learn from them and we can use that, that knowledge and that skill set, you know, to, to grow the business. Um, another you know, recommendation I would give to Josh is, is listen to your market, you know, listen to your clients they will help you identify gaps. If you're doing, you know, business reviews with them or, you know, you have feedback loops, they'll help you identify if, you know, they had a poor experience, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in onboarding or they had a poor experience with some, uh, you know, some interaction with your team somewhere along the way, or maybe it's the returns process or I, I don't know, you know, what, whatever, right? Listen to your clients in those feedback loops because they'll help you help you identify gaps and maybe it's something you don't have the time to to work on and solve um and maybe you don't have the expertise but you can find somebody who does so um any other thoughts on you know kind of building the right team and as jim collins says you know you mentioned good to great but getting the right the right cheeks in the right seats on the bus right um any other thoughts on that yeah, one more quick thought on that is that, you know, a lot of times uh, people focus on their customer as being their only customer, but, but honestly, your team are your first line customers. You have to take care of the people that have stepped up and said, hey, I'm going to get on this bus with you. You know, taking care of your people, valuing them, um, appreciating them, showing how much they mean to you, talking about the good things that they're doing, recognizing their strengths. Another really great book, and it's a like an hour long read. It's a cute, a quick little book. It's called one minute manager. And, um, like it just, it, it just talks about how you really empower people to do their jobs. They, they set their own goals and they, they, you know, they basically, uh, you know, have their own set of, of, of goals, but you, you acknowledge them when they do things good. And then when they mess up, you have a one minute conversation with them about why that didn't work. And then you praise them for what they're doing right. And you move on. And so really just, giving your team an environment where it's okay to make a mistake 
but you just value the hell out of them and you, you treat them well and you um, tell them all the time how much you appreciate them. People who feel appreciated will do more than what's expected of them. So yeah, just make sure that you know that your, your first line customer is your employees, your people. Yeah. And that, that will go so far to, to creating the right type of culture that leads to a productive, you know, hyper-productive team and environment that can scale at a rapid pace, you know, um, when, when, you, and I see it, you know, still, it, it amazes me sometimes in, in this modern world, like how many founders and entrepreneurs think that um, if they're that really um, kind of angry asshole boss, like that, that's going to get things done. And the reality is that, you know, the, the more you collaborate and make people feel, um, you know, engaged in something important, the more that they feel appreciated, rewarded, fulfilled in their roles, the, the more they're going to give to it. You know, the more they're going to give their hot, you know, uh, blood, sweat and tears and their heart to it. And they're going to be, you know, uh, focused in on, on the vision with you. Um, if you're a jerk, you're not going to have loyalty. And, and honestly, your, your culture is going to suffer significantly. So uh, certainly treat, treat your people well. You know, we're all humans and, and uh, people make mistakes. And I think you, you, you know, you mentioned something really important. You know, don't dwell on the mistakes. I mean, if they're big enough, you got to sit down, you got to figure them out, you know. But we don't like people around here make mistakes sometimes, but we don't they don't get reprimanded. We sit down and say, OK, this situation didn't work out. Right. It didn't produce the right results for the client or maybe it didn't produce the right results for somebody internally. What happened? What went wrong? What were our blind spots? What did we learn from it? How do we fix that in the future and not let it happen again? Right. And we collaborate together to figure it out. Now, if you have repeat offenders, sometimes you're going to have to, you know, smack some hands or, or you know, fire people. Um, it just, you know, Boy, stuff has to happen like that. But but you start out, you know, um, as gracious as you can in the process, right? Agreed. And I think empowering people to do their jobs, like I was talking about earlier, you know, we when you really give somebody all your trust and say, listen, this is your job. And I'm not going to micromanage you. I'm not going to look over your shoulder every day and make sure you're doing your job. Like, I, I don't even... I don't know. I don't even care that much about the 40 hours of work, right? Like I don't, I'm not paying you to sit in your chair for 40 hours. I'm paying you to get this job done. If you can do it in 30, good for you. Like I want people to, to feel empowered to do their jobs efficiently and effectively um, while not killing themselves to do that job. Right. So it, there's a, there's a system of doing business called OKRs um, objectives and uh, key results. And it was developed by Andrew Grove, who's the CEO of Intel. Intel, and then um, uh, what's his name? Dewar, uh, John Dewar. He he's gone and taught it to millions of people. I don't know, maybe that's that's a big number, but a lot, thousands and thousands of people, right? He's taught this system to people, and and and, and OKRs is is what they call it. And, and you basically just everybody in the company, from the CEO all the way down, uh, you know, to the receptionist, has objectives that they set for each quarter or for a year or whatever for a company as a whole or, or as a personal on a personal level and they're all visible to the rest of the company you could go in the ceo's office anytime and see his objectives for the for the year or for the quarter and um, that way everybody on your team knows what their jobs are and they're not not five people are not working on the same objectives but and then you have a system of scoring at the end of that time period how did you do you know and so you let those people kind of self-manage you know they say these are my objectives is, and I'm going to hit these results. Um, and if I don't, then we'll, we'll, we'll adjust. And one thing that I really loved about that is that they, they don't ever want anybody to hit a hundred percent of their objectives, because if they do, then they're setting their objective too low. Their goals are too small. They want, they want to set goals so big and so audacious. I can't remember who, who said, who said a uh, big, hairy, audacious goals. I can't remember yeah. what that's from, but Behags, yeah, yeah. you set these goals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Big goals that are so crazy almost that just kind of shake their head and go, are you serious? Like, you can't do that. Well, it makes people go, oh, really? Yes, I can. You watch me. And it really, like, it setting goals that are so huge that people almost feel like they can't do it is, is a way to motivate people to, to get their brains to think outside of the box and to accomplish things that people never actually thought were possible. So, you know, empowering people to do their job, trusting that they're going to do it and then letting and getting out of their way and letting them do it is a really great way to, to manage a, effectively manage a team. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and again, that's something you have to build as part of your culture. I would recommend on, on that note, by the way, uh, reading the book, 
um, why did this escape me? Zombie Loyalist. And I forget the author's name of that as well. Yeah, Zombie Loyalist. It's, it's about empowering your people to make the right choices. And, and that, let me tell you, as, a, as an early entrepreneur, uh, you know, having started this business at 23 years old and kind of being a perfectionist, um, you know, that, that's one of the lessons I learned the hard way. And I was really bottlenecking the business. I was, I was goofing up the culture. Uh, of course, people don't like having somebody over their shoulder and being told all the time, you know, what to do, how to do it. And it's not scalable in any way whatsoever. And, and I had to come to that realization and get the hell out of my own way and say, okay, like I need to be able to trust these people. And certainly you learn as well to hire better so that you have people that you can trust, um, you, you know, to just turn over. Um, here's the vision. Here's what we want to do. What are your thoughts on it? Fantastic. We're on the same page. Move forward. Make it happen. Right. You you do your thing. Of course, you got to have some accountability and report back and all that kind of stuff. But um, you know, uh, uh, you have to be able to trust them, right? To to do that. Um, so quickly, um, Kardik did ask, uh, what are business reviews with clients and. Uh, just to quickly answer that question, that's going to look really different depending upon the type of business or product or service that, that you are offering. Um, for me, in business to business services, depending upon our client, we have a monthly or quarterly sit down with them. It's, uh, you know, we're looking at the, the business relationship. What's working really well right now? What isn't working so great? What can we improve upon? What needs to stop? Um, you know, what would you like to see? What ideas do you have that can add more value? And so that's how we do a business review. But if you're a, you know, if you're an app or a game or a SaaS platform, you're probably, your business reviews are more like, you know, a, a, a feedback loop, you know, whether that's a Google review or you're actually, you know, sending out surveys that you're getting people to fill out or, or that kind of stuff. Um, so um, I know, you mentioned, uh, you know, kind of setting your ego aside. Let's talk a little bit more about that, Stephanie. Um, tell me a little bit more about why it's important for, you know, a founder, an entrepreneur to learn to set your ego aside. You know, um, being, being humble is, is a good lesson for a lot of people, and often it comes with age. Um, but, you know, it, like you were saying earlier, if you're kind of a jerk boss or a jerk in a, in a meeting or a jerk in, in front of investors, People aren't going to want to work with you or for you, and they're not going to be aligned in your vision. And they're not going to believe your vision, right? So, you know, it just it comes along with that whole I, I don't have to know everything. You know, if people think you know you're a know it all, they just don't listen anymore, right? So we learn the most when we stop talking and when we're listening. We don't learn when we're talking; we learn when we're listening. So being able to just just be quiet sometimes times and let people feel safe enough to come to you and say, Hey, listen, you know, I don't know if this is going to work or I, you said something that made me hurt my feelings or, you know, whatever, just, but ultimately knowing that you don't have to know everything and, you, and it's better if you don't know everything, let people contribute. People want to feel like they have value. It's kind of like in parenting when, you know, if you're, if you're the mom and you do everything in the house, you do all the chores, your kids don't do anything. They don't, they don't contribute. They don't feel valuable inside the home. So even from a little, a young age, my kids all had jobs. They all had chores, um, you know, putting their clothes away or emptying the dishwasher, or doing the dishes or, or whatever, just whatever age appropriate jobs, you know, where they, they could do. And it, it gives people a purpose. It, it makes them feel like they're a part of this community. Their contribution matters and they feel good about themselves. They feel important. They feel valuable. And when people don't feel valued, they don't want to contribute. And so I think that just knowing that your ego can get in the way of people wanting to be near you or contribute to your, your purpose or your, or your vision is really important. And treat, you know, treat people with respect. It's not hard. You know, just everybody's different. Everybody has value at some level. Everybody has something to contribute. And when, um, I can't remember who says they treat the janitor with the same respect as that you would treat the CEO. And that's really important. You know, everybody is where they are in life. They're, they're, you know, where they started. I, I read an article recently about 
um, a janitor at Doritos company or something. And he, he, um, you know, he was like, I'm going to, you know, clean the floor to the best of my ability. It's going to be the best floor that ever was. And at some point he ended up, uh, he, he's now like running one division of the company because he had this idea for, um, you know, some spicy Cheetos or something. I, I'm butchering the story, but essentially he, he did his job so well that when he had an idea, they listened because they respected that he cared about his job and, and the, the representation of himself was so good. And they were so impressed by him as an employee that they heard him and then he was able to move up the ranks and run this, um, this division of the company. So really accept the fact that don't, don't judge this person who might be at this point in their life right now and assume that they don't have something to contribute or value to give. I mean, each of us has started here and eventually we get to here, but that person has ideas. They have knowledge we don't have and experience we don't have. And, 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 you know, there just takes one little idea to change an entire company or change the world, honestly. So listen to people, value their thoughts and their, their opinion and their feedback based on their history and their life and their experiences, you know? Yeah. Really, really wise advice there. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd add to that is that, um, if you don't learn to put your ego aside, you're going to have a really hard time being successful as an entrepreneur. Uh, and I say that because the reality is, is entrepreneurship will smack you in the face time and time and time again. And you're probably going to be wrong more often than you are right. And so you've got to get really used to, you know, there's a saying, get comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? Um, get used to being wrong, get used to being, you know, being able to admit and be humble and say, okay, that assumption was incorrect. That didn't work. We got to, we got to iterate. We got to go back and figure this out. We got to pivot. Um, and so, uh, it, you know, but, but if you, if you're too, um, sold on, on yourself, right. And, and you can't like, you can't admit that you did something wrong. You're going to get stuck somewhere that you're never going to be able to get out of. Right. Um, so you, that it's super important to be able to, to learn humility as an entrepreneur and figure out when, when it's the right time to say I was wrong and maybe you were right. Maybe, maybe somebody else had the right idea. Maybe somebody else had the right solution. Right. And you didn't listen and it's okay, you know, to say, you know what, I'm sorry, I goofed up. I was wrong. We need to try what you said because the data is supporting that. Right. Um, exactly. so, um, so, uh, you want to, I, I know we talked a little bit about, uh, expectations and, and the important role of expectations in entrepreneurship. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. So, I mean, I guess that that's, that could be, a, that could mean a lot of things, right. But specifically, I mean, you know, when you, when you have a business plan and you kind of stick to it and it's a roadmap, but you got to know that there's going to be so many things that happen and come up that you didn't even foresee. You had no idea were going to, going to come up, but ultimately expect it to take three to 10 times longer than you thought it was going to everything from the time it's going to take for your labels to get printed to the time it's going to take for you to find a building to the time it's going to take for you to get funding to the, to the time it's going to take for you to get launched. I mean, it seems like every person that you're connected to, there's, there's the more, you know, connections you have in starting a business, the more, the more places there are that can go wrong. Right. So as long as you just have in your mind, okay, if I, if your runway is a year, expect it to take two, you know, and be okay with that. And just because when you have expectations and they keep getting pushed or broken or, or you get let down, eventually you just get broken. And you, so if you don't expect that, if you don't expect the unexpected, it's, it's hard not to quit. Sometimes you just, you just, it just hits you and hits you and hits you and you just get knocked down and you're like, I don't want to get up again. But if you know that's going to happen or expecting it, then you can just bob and weave through it. And you're like, okay, I didn't see that coming, but we're good. I got this, you know, and that's why mentors are so important. There's a couple of comments here from Jeb about mentors and they really are so important because they've been here and they've done that. And so when you say to your mentor, Oh my gosh, this just happened to me. I didn't see it coming. What am I supposed to do? They can often kind of laugh about it and go, okay, I know it seems like a huge deal right now, but trust me, it's not. And here's why, because here's how we're going to fix it. And here's how we're going to work around that. And it's okay. And so it's, it's, it's nice to be able to have somebody that isn't right in the heat of it in the thick of it with you kind of like panicking and freaking out that can just go, okay, 
let's let's pause, right? So it's going to cost more than you think it's going to cost. It's going to take longer than you think it's going to take. And those things are okay. You just have to plan for that. You have to say, okay, here's my plan. But if it takes this long, I'm ready because I have enough money. I have enough, you know, I have, I have enough um, fortitude to be able to stick it out. And, and part of that is, is knowing that self-care is important. As, in, as, as entrepreneurs, often we spend 100 hours or more a week on our businesses. And the whole reason we start businesses in the first place is so that we have more time in our lives, right? We have money and time to spend the way we want with the people that we want and to have freedom not to work for other people. But we get stuck in this 100-hour week rut because we're just head down. We're working so hard. We want it to happen so bad, and we're, we're so dedicated. And that's good. You have to have that. As an entrepreneur, you have to be able to have that kind of fortitude and stick to itiveness to make it happen. But you also have to be able to have balance. As a mother of five kids, I have to be able to separate work and home and, and finances and fun. And, you know, you, you got to set boundaries with your time and with your energy, you know, put a cap on who has access to your energy. You don't have to say yes to every person that wants your time or your energy. You can say no, get really, really good at saying no. You got to get good at delegating. You got to get at saying no. And then you've got to get good at scheduling. Say, these are my business hours. These are, these are the times that I work on my business. And if you have a job and you're doing a business on the side, I just still have to do the same thing. Okay. I do my job from nine to five and I do my business from, you know, six to 10 or whatever. But on Saturdays, I spend all the whole day with my kids or on Sundays, I take a hike or I do yoga or whatever, but you have to schedule your time and you have to schedule your life and then use your mentors, what which is what they're there for. Reach out to them when expectations, you know, things that have, the things that come up that you didn't expect because they will be able to see things from a different perspective that you couldn't see. So um, I'm trying to think what else expectations I, I wanted to talk about. Um, yeah, just have contingency plans. Know how you tell yourself you're going to respond a certain way to anything that comes up before it even happens. That way, you're when you're caught off guard, you you've already you've already planned with yourself. Hey, this is how I'm going to handle it. When things come up, I'm going to do these three things. I'm going to pause. I'm going to wait till the next day to make a decision, and I'm going to talk to my mentor. Like, just decide what your plan is for how to, to how to um, handle the unexpected. Yeah, really, really great advice there. Um, you know, funny enough, uh, Jeb, you know, mentions uh, the the value of mentors. And actually, Jeb is one of, I consider Jeb one of my mentors. I think he's a, an extremely smart um, person and uh, certainly has been very successful in his own career and his leadership journey, um, you know, and, and his venture right now. Uh, that is something that I, that I again learned the hard way. Uh, starting this business at 23 years old, having come from a, a working class blue collar family, um, you know, from the, uh, the wrong side of the tracks per se, you know, um, and I didn't, I didn't come with an installed network. I didn't know the first damn thing about business. Honestly, I did not. And I didn't know the value of, nor did I even know how to access network and mentors, you know, and it took me a long time to kind of figure that out and, and to begin to really go, okay, now I've got a support network here. You know, now I've got people who, who care enough about me and, you know, what I'm doing in my venture that they're, you know, willing to give time and granted, sometimes you got to pay for that. Right. Um, uh, but, um, you know, having those people and sometimes that's going to be, you create an advisory board out of your clients, right? Or sometimes it's an advisory board from your investors. Sometimes you're creating an actual board. Sometimes it's, you know, find peer groups, find, um, um, you know, industry best practice groups and that kind of stuff, right? That uh, you can learn from people who have been in business, uh, you know, and have done things, uh, you know, they've been there longer than you have and have done a lot more things than you have. Um, I, I can't you know, stress how important that is to, to really find your footing and beginning to really uh, figure out how to make a business click as an entrepreneur. Absolutely. And finding your tribe is so critical because you have your people, right? Your friends and your family and stuff, but your business tribe, that's a whole separate group of people. And you and I are both members of a, a group called BMG, which honestly has been a game changer for me. I had made a decision a couple of years ago that I wanted to elevate my circle of influence. You know, they say the average of the, the 
five people you hang out with the most is, is ultimately where you're going to end up. Or I tell my kids all the time, you know, you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And that's so true. You know, if, if all your, the people that you spend all your time with are only talking about other people and small things and complaining about politics and whatever, you know, like complaining about all the things that are going wrong in the world, you're not going to get anywhere. So you've got to elevate the conversations that you're hearing and the conversations that you're having and set at a different table, right? Like, I, and I just decided I am going to sit at a different table. I'm going to find a table full of people that are having conversations that I want to be a part of. And I'm going to sit myself at that table until I'm where I want to be. And that's what this group has done for me. And I got to meet people like you and other business contacts and honestly, just friends, people who think like I think and are doing things that everybody's doing something completely different than what I'm doing, but they're all about the same thing, which is empowering others and doing something good for others. And helping other people be successful and so there is no shortage of groups out there i think you find the one that fits your vibe the best and you get in there and you make friends and you call people and you reach out and you you make sure that your head is in the right place because your mindset is so important and if you don't have people that are gassing you up and supporting your mindset with similar thought process you're just going to get stuck yeah, no, 100%. It's totally accurate. Stephanie, we are out of time. This has been an awesome hour. It went so fast, and I know we have a whole list of topics we didn't even get to, so we're going to have to do version 2.0. Um, I I really appreciate your, you know, you sharing who you are, sharing your abundance, your experience, um, you know, your um, all your ideas that this hour. It's been very valuable for me. I've learned a ton. I know that the guests have learned a lot as well. Um, we thank all the guests for joining us. Uh, again, you know, in the coming weeks, look out for um, announcements for the next segments of TechBeat and some of the other cool guests that I'll be bringing on. Um, thank you again, Stephanie and guests, and we're, we're going to sign off. Yeah. See y'all.